Hello. All right. Sweet. You guys can uh, take your seats. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn into Romans chapter 5. We're continuing in our study into the book of Romans. Uh, I'm having a good time reading it. Are you guys having a good time? Good. Thank you, Joe. That was amazing. That was amazing. I was looking for a a unison, like, yes, but I got an individual yes from Joe. Thank you, Joe. You are amazing. That was awesome. And now I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks. I'm just kidding. Um, So Romans chapter 5, and we're going to start actually in verse 6. Last week, Eric covered with us all the way up to verse 8. But um, I think that the line of thought goes all the way uh, from six uh, further, and it's all connected, so we're going to oftentimes uh, mix it up as we, as we go, and uh, teachings are going to run together, and as well they should. So uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 6, uh, we're going to try to go through um, 6 through 11 pretty quickly, and then sit kind of in verses 12 all the way to the end. Uh, But this is what it reads. It reads this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And this is the train of thought that he has here. He says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. You know, you always ask the question uh, when you see somebody, or, you know, this is like one of those hypothetical questions. If you see Uh, Someone that you love drowning and someone that you don't love, who are you going to save? You only have one chance to save someone. Who are you going to save? Honestly, probably the person you love, right? And this is the line of reasoning that that Paul's saying. He's like, it's reasonable to die for somebody who's worth dying for, someone that you love and who has done good things. But if you see someone who's just an evil and wicked person and they're drowning, you're likely going to go, well, I mean, they, they kind of deserve it. And I have one jump, and I can save one of them. I'm going to save the, the better person. So he says, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, and, uh, though per, or an unrighteous person, uh, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. So this is exactly what happened with us according to Romans chapter 1 through 4 is that God looked at us and he saw our sin. And he saw us as deserving of the wrath and judgment of God. But it says, still Christ chose to die for us. Since therefore, and this is his line of reasoning, since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath. It's simple. We are positionally guilty before God, and Christ died for us, even though we were positionally guilty. Now we have become positionally guiltless because of what Christ did. And so Paul says, if God did this much for you whenever you were a sinner, now that you have come to faith in Jesus Christ and given your life to him and become positionally righteous before God, and right with God, how much more? He says, do the math. In verse 10, he says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, he says again, do the math. Much more, now that we've been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. If through his death we were reconciled, imagine what can be done through Christ's life. If his death was the wrath of God placed on Jesus, then what does that mean for his resurrection and the life that we now have in Christ? If God can do so much with so bad, just imagine. Paul says, do the math. Verse 11, but then that we also rejoice, or more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let me read that again because that's going to set us up for verse 12 and onward. More than that, we rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who's done all of these things, and through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation implies three steps, really. 
First is a relationship, something going right, something the way it's supposed to be. That's the first step. The second step is that thing that was right being broken. And the third step is the mending of that thing. So whenever he speaks of reconciliation here, he sets us up for what he's going to share about all of humanity in the next verse, verse 12. Have you ever asked the question to yourself or to others, what in the world is going on? Or have you ever asked the question, what is wrong with the world? What is going on? Why do people act the way that they act? And if we're honest, sometimes you ask the question about yourself. Why do I act the way that I act? Why do I do the things that I do sometimes? I know that I'm not supposed to do that particular thing, but I do it. This passage of scripture, Paul will go into, or at least this passage of scripture answers that question for us. And what's wrong with the world? Our main idea today is simple. It's this, Jesus restores what was broken by Adam. Jesus restores what was broken by Adam. Reconciliation. Now he goes into verse 12. Therefore, it says this, just as sin came into the world through one man, and this man being Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin. What is sin? The Greek word is hamartia. The Greek word is a archery term used in the Greek uh, to denote when someone shoots an arrow at a target and misses the target. So when you see the word sin, in the New Testament, know that that word is likely that archery term. That means you've missed the mark. Specifically, uh, in this situation, as it per uh, pertains to the sin that came into the world through one man, that sin and missing the mark was in disobedience to God. And a broader way to think of sin is simply wrongdoing. So we see the scripture say here that just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Sin came into the world through one man. One person representing the many. Theologians have called this federal headship. Federal headship. One person representing the many. Our modern Western sensibilities kind of sometimes have trouble with this idea and this thought. We think sometimes, well, that's not fair. Who elected Adam? Well, that's not fair. I, I didn't elect him. Why does he represent me? I don't get a say in who represents me. That's weird. In fact, for me, you know, we hear the story of David and Goliath all the time. Uh, if you've not heard the story of David and Goliath in the Old Testament, um, it's uh, basically a little man, David, who's a shepherd board, not, not trained in uh, the arts of war, uh, trained in like protecting the sheep from uh, bears and lions and things of that sort, but he's a shepherd boy and God calls him to deliver Israel from the Philistines and the Philistines were represented by one man on the field of battle. They had been battling for a long time, and then they all decided, well, let's just do this. Let's play this game. Let's say, I'll bring out my strongest warrior, and you bring out your strongest warrior. And we know the story. The story goes like this. David comes out with a slingshot, and he throws it into the head of Goliath, and he kills Goliath, and he saves all of Israel. And that's it. Now, I'm... Always, like, like I've gotten past, like, little man destroys the big guy. You know, I'm like, okay, I got that. But the thing that always gets me is, like, I'm like, in what world does that work? In what world does this one person represent this other person? Like, you're telling me that, like, on a fluke kind of chance, all of a sudden now the, the war is over because one person beat another person? 
you know, for us, that sounds kind of strange. Um, if, if I were to bring it into uh, Western terms, I think about taxes and having a tax man. You sign off on the tax man doing your taxes, uh, and when the IRS sees what uh, that tax person has done, uh, it is uh, attributed to you, so you are liable to the IRS based on what your tax person does because you've signed off. Another example uh, is possibly uh, two years ago, I went on this amazing trip down the Kenai, and as I was uh, there, I was with a couple friends, uh, you know, they were an awesome family called the Fitzgeralds. Uh, now, the Fitzgeralds are Blake playing the guitar, Chaz rocking it out, Beth just, you know, being amazing, as always. And so, uh, we went down, and um, it was uh, maybe early in the, in the runs, and uh, we weren't expecting maybe for it to be too crazy, you know, uh, we, we had heard reports that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't hitting that great, so we wake up in the morning, we go, and it was like the floodgates opened up, and apparently, this is my first time there, um, Brock, their other son, uh, mentioned like, hey, he's like, man, this, I've never experienced this, this is amazing, so as we're going out, we're looking into the river, and it was, it was like, some, I was, I've never experienced it before. I looked in the river, and I could barely see the ground because the fish were swimming. So, so many fish. And for the first time, you know, fly fishing for some silvers, it was just like so easy, like right in the mouth, come on out. And three was the limit that day. It should have been like ten, but who's counting? I was. And so here's the thing is like we catch our limit in like, I don't know, it was like an hour, an hour and a half. It, it's super, super simple. It could have been done even faster by someone else. And it was, actually, the guy beside of me is who I'm about to talk about. This guy, you know, uh, he, you know, in Alaska, the truth is, like, everyone's like, hey, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. That's what I've experienced here. But when it comes to fishing, when it comes to rules on hunting and things like that, people are a little bit more strict. And so this guy, he's going, he's just one, two, three, and I'm like, okay, that guy's done, four, <laughs> five, and I'm like, and all of a sudden, I can see, like, the tension in the river as everyone's like, what is this guy doing? Like, this dude is breaking rules. Like, he is getting more than his share, and he goes, ah, well, boom, six. He gets six, and he finishes, and some people are starting to ask questions, like, hey, man, the limit's three. What's the deal, man? He pulls out a card, and it says that he is a proxy for his household. There's someone in his household who does not have the ability to come out and fish. So he is his stand-in, or their stand-in, and he was able to get six fish just like that. A proxy, someone to represent us. The scriptures speak of Adam being that representative, representative to us. He acts for us. Therefore, what he did and does is counted as what we do. He didn't just sin for us, but he sinned, or but we sinned in him. His choice, according to scripture, was our choice. If you're still having trouble or a hard time with that concept, maybe these few things could help. First, we have to understand that the conditions were just right for Adam. He had everything at his uh, disposal, everything that he needed to succeed, and still he didn't. The second thing is this, and it says here in the scriptures that death spread to all men because all sinned. The fact is that you and I, given the same situation... In the same story, we would have, in fact, done the same thing. And that is only affirmed by the fact that we sin on the daily. In verse, or the third thing is this. As to why this concept of federal or covenant headship is so important is this. That Paul hinges his argument on why Jesus can be our representative he hinges his argument on this fact that Adam was our representative. 
So here's what we learn is this, that Adam's disobedience brought death, suffering, and brokenness to humanity. Adam's disobedience brought death, suffering, and brokenness to humanity. What is wrong with this world? That is where it started. Adam's disobedience resulted in really three things that I think we can see from this, uh, this passage of Scripture. In verse 14, uh, if you'd like uh, some, some proof text, uh, the first thing is this, it, physical death to all. God looked at Adam and said, the day that you eat of the tree, death will come. And in fact, it did. And in this way, the first thing, physical death, we all experience physical death and suffering. As we talked about last week. The second thing, an imputation of legal guilt for his sin. What he did, what Adam did, we received that guilt on us. And the third thing, we experience spiritual death, not just physical death, but Adam's choice resulted in spiritual death to all. A sinful nature which gives us the propensity to sin. And we can see more of that in verse 19, which we're going to go into. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 and 3, uh, for another passage of scripture where Paul speaks of this sinful nature and what I've done is I have taken it, taken it out of past tense and I put it in present tense for us uh, so that we can understand uh, where we were. Um, and this is what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, because he's talking to Christians as uh, mostly I am speaking today to. Uh, but this was our plot or plight in life um, before we came to know Jesus. Chapter 2 verses 1 and 3 of Ephesians. And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walk following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom you all live in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and are, listen to this, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Now, Paul speaks that to the Ephesian believers in the past tense because the next verse in verse 4, he uses uh, these amazing words, but God, who is rich in love and mercy, for which he loved us, he sent Jesus Christ, and he offered forgiveness through faith, through God's grace. And so this is what we see in verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. And you could be thinking, well, I thought we were sinners because we broke the law. And Paul can anticipate this. That's why he goes into the next verse, verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Verse 14, this is important. Yet death reigned from Adam all the way to Moses. Moses is where the law came, right? On the Mount Sinai, Moses went up to receive the law. But before Moses went and received the law, we see that this truth was evident, that sin was in the world. That wrongdoing was in the world. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, context will tell us that Paul isn't saying that people aren't guilty, but there is a sense in which their sinning or their wrongdoing is different. As established earlier in the letter, that Paul has written to the Romans in chapter 1, everyone is aware of the fact that there is a God through nature and through conscience. We're all sinners, and we all have uh, some sort of accountability uh, toward God. It says, yet death reigned from Adam to Noah. Sin's ramifications, death, 
suffering, wrongdoing were still experienced during that time. So much so that God even judged the world for wrongdoing during the time of Noah in between Adam and Moses. But this is what we also have to see is that faith, the thing that saves us today as well as in the past, faith was available to people there as well. Remember Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he shared the truth of God and even invited people to come onto the ark during that time. Faith was available. And we see that just a couple, or just one chapter back in Romans, as Paul makes an argument about how Abraham is the father of faith, even though he did not have the law. And all of scripture follows sinners who faith, who trust in God. Even though it was not like the transgression of Adam. Transgression is a stepping over of the line. It's not just wrongdoing. It's wrongdoing like you're stepping over the line. You see the line and you step over it. Adam had a specific command. Others have general revelation, conscience. And here at the end of this verse, verse uh, 14, it says this. Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. We see in Romans chapter 5 that Adam was a shadow of Jesus And thus, Paul will begin his contrast of Adam's work with the superiority of Christ's work. An appropriate way to say this is that Jesus is the antitype, or Adam is the antitype of Jesus. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the trespass. Many died because of one. And we all experience that, as I said earlier, on the daily. But many have received grace the free gift of God through the one. Maybe you don't like the idea of one man representing many. Well, you're going to run into problems because that's exactly what Jesus did. It's a free gift, and it's not like the trespass. Christ's work far exceeds the work and the failure of Adam's in result and in scope. And I love this because we just read earlier He said, do the math, right? Here again, he says the same thing. Death reigned through one man much more. Do the math. Will those who receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man? Well, it it, it says that again. But it says much more have the grace of God. So here's the next thing we can learn is that yes, Adam's disobedience brought brought death and suffering and brokenness to the humanity, but Jesus' obedience makes life, hope, and restoration available to humanity. Jesus' obedience makes life, hope, and restoration available to humanity. Verse 16, the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following, listen to this, many trespasses brought justification. In view here, Paul is not just thinking about that one sin. Yes, it was one sin that brought death to humanity. But since then, there has been a plethora of sin. And when Jesus came, Jesus took care of past, present, and future sins on himself. The free gift that followed many trespasses. Jesus not only covers this one man's sin, but all of humanity's sin afterward. Brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man. Listen, do the math. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace 
and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. This is important. The first representative that we had is what we were born into. And we affirm through our sin, through our sins that we commit. The second man must be affirmed through faith and then we are born under his kingdom. I'm going to say that again. The first representative is what we were born into. And we affirm through our actions and our disobedience and our wrongdoing. The second must be affirmed through faith and trust in God. And when we affirm through faith, we are born under his kingdom and into his kingdom and into his family and under the headship of Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 12 says this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What a glorious work that God did. And here's something we can learn from this passage. You must receive Jesus through faith to be made right with God. You must receive Jesus through faith to be made right with God. And when that happens, this passage says here that no longer will death reign. Again, we're going to see the contrast here. Under Adam, death reigned. Under Christ, we reign. And we reign in life with him. Restoration of God's plan. Genesis chapter 1, 28, to go back to the beginning and see Adam It says this, God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful. This was God's intent for humanity. Be fruitful and multiply. That's why there's eternity in our hearts. That's why there's this feeling of angst when we think about how bad the world is. Yes, there's glimmers of hope and there's good, and we can do good things. But we know that there's this underlying, as the psalmist said in chapter, or uh, Psalm 23, that we are walking in the shadow of death, death looming over. Even in our most joyful occasions, we know that death looms, and we see it rear its ugly head when we lose lost loved ones. We see it rear its head whenever we do wrong, and we know that we're doing wrong. We see it whenever we are mistreated. We see it. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That word subdue is to cultivate. We were to cultivate life here on earth. That was what God, the command that God gave to Adam and Eve. And have dominion over the fish of the sea. Catch those Russian river salmon, man. That's awesome. And over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That was God's original intent. Cultivate and rule. And what Christ does with his work is he brings us back to that. Revelation 5, 10, looking to a future hope. It says this, and you, speaking of Jesus, have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So what Adam broke, Jesus Christ fixed. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Again, Adam's sin According to this scripture, one trespass led to condemnation was enough to condemn the world. But instead, one act of righteousness by Jesus Christ leads to life for all men. And that has been qualified. This is not speaking of universalism, where all of a sudden Jesus covers everybody. But the qualifier has already been stated in this passage of scripture that is for those who have received. We have the opportunity to receive the work that Christ did in our lives. It's a free gift. Just like 
the beginning, God is not going to force his will on any of us. Just like he did with Adam, he said, you have the choice. You can eat of the tree or you can enjoy and subdue and, and cultivate the earth. And Adam chose disobedience. God is not going to go against our free will. But you can receive it, the work that Jesus has done. It's available to all, though all will not accept it. Anyone can be made right with God. Anyone can be made right with God. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. One man's disobedience made us sinners. Here we see we're not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. And here's the question for us tonight. Is will we choose to continue to be under Adam or will we choose to be under Christ? Will we choose to be in Adam or will we choose to be in Christ? Because of Adam's sin, those born under Adam are sinners. Because of Christ's obedience, those who are born again are made right. And that's not to say we don't sin. The scriptures are very clear. When we're born again, we still have sin present in us, and we still will miss the mark. But 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is the glorious news of this passage of Scripture, is that Jesus came to do what the first Adam did not do. He could have, but he came to do what the first Adam did not do. And consequently, what we continually can't do. The first Adam was given an opportunity and to disobey. Have you guys ever thought about what if, what if Adam hadn't done that? Man, could you imagine this world, the potential that Adam and Eve had there and the life and the joy and the experience of this world without suffering, and without death, without pain, without anguish. Well, the good news is that Jesus came to reconcile us back to God in that in intent and purpose. And to continue from glory, as scriptures say, from glory to glory. To glory. You are either in Adam, sorry about that, or you are in Christ. And I'm going to read these last two verses. Uh, they're in uh, super connection with the next verses, but uh, we'll read them. It says this, now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. May I encourage you today, if you've never given your life to Jesus or received the gift that he has for you, may I encourage you to consider what has been said today. If you're listening online, if you're hearing this teaching, consider what Jesus has done. If you're in here and you have made that consideration and you have become under and in Christ, rejoice in that. And I encourage you to walk in that newness of life, which Paul is going to get more into in the next couple chapters. And I hope that you guys join us for the next few chapters. Um, but let me do this. Let me pray. And then I'll let you guys go and we can still hang out. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Uh, your word is good. And I'm really happy 
that we have it to help us to make sense of the world that we know. Lord, I ask that you would help us as we continue to read in your word, uh, to study through your word, that we would continue to listen to your voice, the things that you have to say. Lord, continue to shape our thoughts, our actions. Lord, thank you so much that you have done so much more. Lord, that you have restored humanity to yourself through Jesus. And you've given us the opportunity to trust in you. And I ask that each of us would trust in you afresh today and every day. That we would continue to be grateful and thankful, God, for your salvation and your reconciliation of the world and the work that you've done. So, God, I ask that you would bless each person here tonight and bless the rest of the time that we have uh, together as a family here at Bartlett High School. And, um, yeah, bless our, bless our fellowship and our hangout time. So we love you and we lift you up and we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.